Welcome to the video for chapter 30. Today we're going to talk about what happens when dipole antennas are not infinitesimal, when they have a finite non-infinitesimal size, and then we're also going to introduce the other fundamental type of antenna called the loop antenna. Um, today our, our, our learning objectives are to talk about electric and magnetic fields in the far field of a finite dipole antenna, to draw the radiation pattern for a finite dipole antenna. We won't be drawing it by hand, but we will uh, see it being drawn by MATLAB. We're going to calculate the electric and magnetic fields and the pointing vector in the far field of a small loop antenna. So we're really, today we're really laying the groundwork for the last two chapters where we're going to be talking about, uh, today we're going to be talking about the two fundamental types of, of really useful antennas, the finite dipole and the loop antenna. And then uh, for the next two times, we're going to be really expanding on what we see today. Our historical perspective today uh, takes us to Japan. We have uh, Dr. Yagi and Dr. Uda, who in, uh, in a Japanese uh, university, Tohoku University, they invented a new type of antenna called the Yagi Uda antenna, which we abbreviate as the Yagi antenna, which is kind of unfortunate. We should abbreviate it as the Uda antenna, because from everything that I've heard, um, Uda was the student who developed the antenna, and then Yagi was the professor who took credit for it. Um, and so uh, it's a little bit unfortunate, but uh, we do in fact uh, benefit from the work that both of these gentlemen did, uh, and the Yagi antenna is something that we'll talk about later on in today's chapter. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when a, when a dipole antenna is no longer infinitesimal. You'll remember that when we, we introduced the antenna last time, we talked about how the length of the antenna would be much, much less than lambda. Um, that's a good place for us to begin our conversation, but what we're going to find is that an infinitesimal dipole is just a terrible, terrible antenna. We would never use an infinitesimal dipole for anything significantly important. Um, to obtain good transmission characteristics, we need much larger antennas. The length of the finite dipole can be a substantial fraction of the wavelength of the signal. It can even exceed the, the wavelength of the signal. And so quite often, a very good length of that dipole antenna would be one half as long as the wavelength. And in fact, that's almost standard. We, we would refer to this as a half wave dipole or half wavelength dipole. Uh, and it has some particularly desirable characteristics, which we're going to talk about in chapter 31. But before we dive into the math, I thought that it would be beneficial for us to just take a little time to have a conceptual understanding of how the dipole antenna works and why it transmits electromagnetic waves. Now, uh, of course, we understand that the, the antenna is going to be driven by, uh, by a function generator or some sort of a, a signal source, and that's going to be going through a transmission line. So you have here the transmission line. And of course, we also know that we know from our earlier discussions that it's very important that the transmission line and the antenna have matched uh, impedances so that we don't get a lot of reflections going back toward the function generator. Um, and we'll talk more about how to match those next time again. So uh, we've got a lot coming up in chapter 31. It's going to be an exciting chapter. So as this figure illustrates, what happens is that in half of the cycle, because it's a sinusoidal wave, uh, positive charges accumulate on the top half of the antenna and negative charges are on the bottom half of the antenna. But in the other half of the cycle, the negative charges accumulate on the top half of the antenna and the positive charges accumulate on the bottom half of the antenna. So what we find then is that it alternates back and forth. It sort of uh, oscillates as, as you would expect of a sinusoidal wave. It's going to oscillate between those, those two options. So the antenna is going to have uh, half of the time with the higher voltage on the top, half the time with the higher voltage on the bottom. And, and of course, those cur the, the, that means that we're going to have to have current flowing. You know, if you wanted to go from the configuration on the left to the configuration on the right, the only way that you could do that is if a whole bunch of current is going to flow from top to bottom. As positive charges flow from top to bottom and negative charges flow from, t from bottom to top, that's going to lead to a current that is going to flow downward. Uh, and of course, that's in preparation or, or in the transition to the second figure there. So what we're going to find is that as the charges are moving back and forth, that's going to create um, uh, it's going to create currents, and the currents are going to create magnetic fields. At the same time, we know that if you have a positive charge and you have a negative charge, we know that there will always be an electric field that points from the positive charge to the negative charge. So we have a current that has magnetic fields flowing around it. That would be the H. And then we also have electric fields. And if you can arrange those electric fields and magnetic fields just right, you can get an S that propagates away. And so what we need to do is prove to ourselves that S, in fact, would propagate away. Remember that S, the pointing vector, represents the direction and magnitude of power flow. 
And if power is flowing away from the antenna consistently, then that is going to be a symbol of the fact that we do in fact have the sort of radiation that we're looking for. So I have sort of added some things to the figure uh, 30.1. And in particular, I've added the current. And, and notice that here, the current that I'm showing, uh, this current right here, uh, that's indicating that in order to achieve the state that we're currently in, the current is flowing upward. Because of course, we have all the positive charges here. And to get those positive charges, we have to have a current that's flowing upward to bring the positive charges there. And if you put your thumb in the direction of that current I and you wrap it around, you'll find that it's pointing into the screen on these, uh, at these points over here. So the X, of course, always represents that the vector is pointing into the screen. Now at the same time, the electric field is pointing from top to bottom because it's pointing from top positive charges down to negative charges. That's why the electric field is, is pointing downward. So the current and the electric field are, are going to be opposed to each other. They're going to be pointing in opposite directions. Now that's not usually the case. Usually what's going to happen is that, is that the electric field and the current are going to be lined up. But what's happening right now is that the charge is changing so rapidly that the electric field and the current get out of phase with each other. They get, they get 180 degrees out of phase. Well, remember that the pointing vector is E cross H, and you've got uh, 15, 20 copies of it on this page to be able to see that. If you put uh, your, your fingers in the direction of E, so you stick your fingers in the direction of E, and then you curl them out of, you curl them, I'm sorry, you curl them into the page. So you put them in the direction of E, and it's kind of hard to manipulate your right hand in that direction, but then you curl them in the direction of H, your thumb will point in the direction uh, of S. And so what you're going to find is that when there are positive charges on the top half, S is, is pointing away from the antenna. But if you look at the right half of this figure, then when, when things reverse, now the positive charges are on the bottom, and therefore to get the positive charges on the bottom, the current has to be flowing downward. But the electric field is going to point from positive charges to negative charges, so it's going to point upward. And then if you, again, put your put your thumb in the direction of the current, so your thumb sticks in the direction of the current here, and when you wrap your fingers around, they're coming out of the page uh, where, where the H's are. So these H's right here are now coming out of the page. So both E and H have both reversed direction. And because they've both reversed direction, uh, now when we do E cross H, it's still pointing in the same direction. Two wrongs don't make a right, but two reverses of a vector do in fact make the cross product stay the same. So you put, put your hand in the direction of, of E, which is pointing up. So you put your fingers in the direction of E. Um, apparently I'm one of the Simpsons. There we go. You put your four fingers in the direction of E, and then you curl them uh, out of the page. This one's a little bit easier to do with your right hand. Curl them out of the page, and your thumb, uh, once again, points in the direction of, of S. So conceptually, just from a, from a strictly conceptual perspective, we can see that S is going to be pointing away from, from this antenna, uh, no matter which phase of, of, the, of the cycle that we're in. Now, another conceptual way of seeing this is, is an animation. I have this animation here that you can click um, to be able to see, and I will now uh, I will click it so you can see the animation as well. So as you can see from this animation, positive charges and negative charges are moving into opposite sides of the dipole antenna. And as they do so, they're creating electric fields. The electric fields point from positive charges to negative charges. Now what this figure doesn't show is that magnetic fields are also being created by the currents that are flowing. It would just it would be really difficult to represent that in this one figure. Uh, but the electric fields and the magnetic fields are being generated at the same time. And as a result, we're finding that the electromagnetic radiation will propagate away from the antenna. So now we have a, a better understanding of what's going on with, uh, with, the, with the conceptual understanding of the dipole antenna. So let's talk about a mathematical description because we need, to, we need to be able to do the math as well. It is, of course, a bit more complicated. That should say complicated. Uh, than this qualitative description. In fact, parts of the derivation are really going to be beyond the scope of our discussion. Um, I don't do this to you very often, but uh, I think that uh, in, in chapter 30 is, is a place where we, we're, we're going to begin to sort of skim the surface a bit because uh, we, we are, we're getting into deep water here and, and places where a derivation might take 10 or 20 pages. I don't think that that's in your interest. Uh, and so I'm just going to tell you the most important parts of the derivation, set them up, and then say dot, 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 and then give you what the result is. So it turns out that often these have to be solved by computer models, iterative solutions, and integral differential equations, which can be even worse than differential equations, if you can believe that. So what we find is that the current on the antenna approaches 
zero towards the two ends of the antenna. You know, if you look up here, um, I was being a little bit simplistic as showing that the current was, was uniform throughout the entire antenna. It's not. Um, you could easily imagine that, you know, toward the middle here, there's, there's not only does this charge have to move to this charge, but this charge also has to move to this charge. And then this charge has to move to this charge. And what you'll find is that all of these transitions are, are crossing the midpoint. So the, the peak of the current is going to be during, or is going to be uh, at the middle. When you get out to the very, the very furthest edges, for example, this negative charge would need to, say, go up to this positive charge. There's really only the one, and out the very edge, there's nothing that really needs to move. So what we find then is that the current is going to be symmetric about the middle, about the center of the, uh, of the antenna. It's going to go to zero in both directions, and it looks something like figure 30.30. So the current flow profile is, is peaking here, it's peaking at the middle, and it goes to zero at the two edges of the antenna. And I've gone ahead and shown a couple of other things that are important here. Over here, this is the observation point. So the observation point. And so we're, we're, looking, we're looking at the strength of the wave that's hitting the observation point. But in order to do that, we need to know the antenna is L long, it has a length of L, and we need to be able to do an integral. And that integral is going to be with respect to Z. We're integrating over Z, where Z represents a particular point along the antenna. Now that particular point is going to be a distance R prime from the observation point which is similar to, but not identical to R, which is the distance from the center of the antenna out to the observation point. In the same way that theta prime, which is the angle from the particular point Z to the observation point, is similar to, but not identical to theta, which is the one that's from the center of the antenna. Now we can simplify a lot of these issues by saying that we're going to go to, quote, the far field. And the far field just simply means the same thing that it meant last time. We're going to go very far away from the antenna. And very far means several wavelengths. You know, it needs to be maybe 10 wavelengths away. Um, and so if you're in the far field, you could imagine if this observation point moved way far away, then really R and R prime are, are essentially equal to each other. And in the same way, theta and theta prime are going to be essentially equal to each other. And so what we find then is that, is that in the far field, the geometry becomes simplified. As, a, as, an, as an undergraduate class, the far field is more than sufficient for, for our challenges. Um, if you took a graduate course in electromagnetic fields, then we might want to study exactly what's going on even in the near field, but that's really going to require computer simulations rather than an, an analytical solution. So we have, uh, we have a picture of what the current profile looks like, and it turns out that that picture can be very well approximated by equation 30.1. So what we find then is that I is uh, essentially a sine wave. And that, that makes sense that the sine wave, or, uh, you, you, it could be a sine or a cosine really, but it's going to be the sine wave uh, of uh, k times L over 2 minus the absolute value of z. And the absolute value there makes it so that the wave is symmetric on, uh, on the top and the bottom because z is positive for the top half, so z is greater than 0, but it's negative, z is less than 0 for the bottom half. So to have that symmetry that we're looking for, we have to use the absolute value of z. So we can take this equation and we can use it to calculate the magnetic field. From the magnetic field, we can calculate the electric field. And from the electric field and the magnetic field, we can calculate the pointing vector. Now, you might remember that we had a discussion last time of the, of the infinitesimal dipole. And what we're going to do is now is we're going to take a superposition of an infinite number of infinitesimal dipoles. It's sort of like uh, any sort of calculus problem where you take a very, very, very thin slice and you add up all of those thin slices. But each thin slice here is an infinitesimal dipole. So what I've done is I've, I've modified equation 29.40. You can go back and see how it used to look, and, and I've really just made very few small changes to it. Um, the I of Z dz is something that was, was, uh, was introduced in place of, I believe it was J, uh, uh, J times uh, an area, or J times a volume. So uh, everything else here has really pretty much stayed the same. Now, if you went back up to figure 30.3, and, and remember that I had said R prime is approximately equal to R uh, in the far field. And that is true. R prime is approximately equal to R. And certainly, if it's just in a regular old part of the equation, you can replace R prime with R. And this right here is a great example of a place that's a regular old occurrence in the equation. We can just strike that R prime. So it just becomes R.
But a place that is not really eligible to do that is this place right here. Because e to the minus j k r prime, uh, if you think about it, that's essentially a, a sinusoid. So it's going to be doing something like this. It's going to be going up and down and up and down and up and down. And what happens is that if you, if you just make a tiny change, let's imagine that we make what seems to be a pretty negligible change in r. If I go from here to here on r, well, notice what's happened is I've, I've, I've gone all the way, I've dramatically changed e to the minus jkr. So just a tiny change in r prime can lead to a dramatic change in, in, the, in the function e to the minus jkr prime. Now this, this term right here, the e to the, this factor, e to the minus jkr prime, represents whether the waves are constructively interfering or destructively interfering. And that is really essential. Uh, we, it, it gets kind of lost in the math here that we are accounting for constructive and destructive interference in these waves. So the, long story short, I know, too late, uh, we can't just uh, get rid of this prime right here. We can't just say, oh, well, don't worry about the, about the r prime there. We can do it in the denominator, but in the exponent, we can't. What we can do, though, is we can do a geometrical analysis of, of the situation, and we can find that r prime is approximately equal to r minus z cosine of theta. This is one of those handful of places where I could take another 10 minutes and prove that to you, or um, if you really, really want to know, come by my office and I'll show it to you. But, but r prime is approximately equal to r minus z cosine of theta. So that's not quite the same thing as saying that r prime is approximately equal to r. We're doing that down here in the denominator, but up in the numerator, we're going to take this to substitute in for r prime. So what you can see is that the e to the minus jk r prime has become e to the minus jk r times the quantity r minus z cosine of theta. Everything else here has really stayed the same. I've, I've uh, done a little bit of rearranging of some terms, but if you look at, if you look at equation 30.2 <clears throat> and then you come down to equation 30.4, the only other thing that has changed is that I've plugged in this expression, this expression plus this constant right here to represent i of z. So those two things represent i of z, and then this represents e to the minus j k r prime. Now, several of these terms are independent of z, and you'll, you'll remember that eventually we're going to need to integrate this with respect to z. But one thing that's not independent of z is this expression. There's this, an absolute value of z in there. Another part of it that's not independent of z is this part of the expression right here. But the e to the minus jkr is independent of z. So we can move all of the constants in front of the integral and e to the minus jkr goes in front of the integral but we have to keep the sine term and we have to keep the e to the jkz cosine theta term so we've fully set up the integral and now you know like uh, like one of those tv chefs i'm going to pull one out of the oven because because th this integral itself doesn't really illustrate any important principles but its solution illustrates what may be the most important principle in the last three chapters of this book. And that is that if you have, um, if you have an antenna with a known radiation pattern, and if you replicate that antenna many times at regular intervals, then the radiation pattern of the resulting antenna system has two factors. One that depends on the individual antenna, that's known as the element factor, and the second one depends on the structure of the replication, which is called the array factor. So this concept of an element factor and an array factor is the most important thing that I want you to take away from the discussion that we're having here. Because it turns out that for an infinitesimal dipole, this is the equation for the element factor. It's just a sine of theta. You might remember from our discussion of the <coughs> excuse me, from our discussion of the, of the infinitesimal dipole, that there was, in fact, a sine of theta term there. And in fact, it was the only theta dependence that we had. So all of everything else, the R dependence, the constants, and everything else is going to be pulled out of F1. Only the theta dependence is going to go into F1. And then F sub A, the array factor, and again, this is beyond the scope of, of, of this course or of this, of this book, uh, certainly of this chapter. What we find then is that the array factor looks like this. And, and it's a really interesting function. And, and I'm going to take a minute uh, to talk about it when we, when we get to the final answer. But, but I just want to make a note that this is a cosine of a cosine. 
and I don't see that anywhere else. There's there's really nowhere else that I've ever seen a cosine of a cosine. So that's just that's an interesting little feature. Now it turns out that the final solution of this e sub theta, which is the electric field that we're trying to calculate, is equal to a whole mess of of variables here, variables and constants. But notice that it includes the phase factor and it also includes the R dependence. Because remember that the, the element factor, F1, and the array factor, F sub A, really only include information about the theta dependence. So we need to include the R dependence separately. And that's what these, these leading factors do. The J60, I sub M, don't, don't worry about that. That's, those are just leading, well, certainly uh, as the amplitude of the amount of current going into the antenna increases, you would expect that the strength of the electric field would increase. The J60 is just the combination of several other constants. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my expression for F1, I'm going to take my expression for FA, I'm going to plug them in to F1 and FA in this equation, and what I'm left with is equation 30.9. Equation 30.9 can only be simplified a little bit. The sine will cancel with the squared in the denominator, and we're left with equation 30.10. So this is the electric field for a finite dipole antenna. Um, and, uh, and, and in the far field. Uh, and it really does have both an R dependence and a theta dependence. Interestingly, they're separated from each other. The theta dependence is really this, this term right here, and the R dependence is this term right here. So if you wanted to know what is the R profile look, you could, use, you could use the first term there, the first factor. If you wanted to know what is the theta profile look like, you could use the second factor. Again, I just wanted to draw your attention to this expression, which is the cosine of KL divided by 2 times the cosine of theta. Really, really important that this be in radians. And actually, you know what? I would say make them all be in radians. I think that you're going you're gonna to be happier if everything in this whole equation is, is in radians uh, because it's going to make your, your math is going to work out easier and, and you won't be liable to make any mistakes. Now that equation has a lot in it, but I think that the best way to il illustrate it is with an, an animation. So I've written a MATLAB code that shows the radiation pattern for the, inf for the finite dipole all the way from 0.1 lambda, for the length of 0.1 lambda, up to 3 lambda. So as, as the length of the antenna, and this should be a scripty L here, as the, as the length of the antenna is ranging from a very, very tiny antenna to an antenna that is actually three times as large as, as the, uh, the wavelength of the signal. And so if you click on this image, uh, if you click on figure 30.4, it will show that animation, and we're going to go ahead and do that now. So here we're going to be able to see the radiation pattern of a finite dipole antenna as a function of the length of the antenna. You can see in the title up here at the top of this plot that the length of the antenna is currently set at 10% of the wavelength of the signal. Um, and, and while that's not, that doesn't strictly qualify uh, as an infinitesimal dipole antenna, it's as close as we're going to get in this, in this animation. So I just want to take a minute and point out that at the very center of this plot, at the bullseye there, you can see there's a tiny, tiny little figure eight. And that figure eight represents the radiation pattern of what is approximately an infinitesimal dipole antenna. Now it's so small because the radiation that is emitted by an infinitesimal dipole antenna is so low. This is one of the reasons, one of several reasons, why an infinitesimal dipole is just a terrible antenna. So we're not going to be using an infinitesimal dipole for anything other than deriving the relationship of a finite dipole antenna. So as we begin to increase it, uh, increase the length of the antenna, I want you to see that the, that, that figure eight is going to grow, uh, and it, that's going to represent the fact that the antenna is doing a more effective job of transmitting electromagnetic magnetic radiation for the same level of input that's being applied to the antenna. So let me go ahead and, and see if I can, and now we're going to be able to see the, uh, the radiation pattern is growing. Pretty soon here we're going to cross through the half wave dipole, and that's right there. That's the half wave dipole. You can see that we're still getting this figure eight, or this sort of sideways infinity that's perpendicular to the direction of, of the antenna itself. Now it's beginning to narrow down. Now we're at the place where the length of the antenna is equal to the wavelength of the signal. Oh, here comes some side lobes, and the main lobes are beginning to shrink down. Uh, and so you can see now at this moment we have six lobes that are going on. We're at one and a half uh, lambda. Looks like a butterfly right there. The, the What used to be the main lobes are now side lobes, and they're shrinking down to, to 
are basically zero. And as we get up to two uh, lambda for the length, now those four, those four main lobes are going to begin to shrink down. We're going to pick up six more lobes. So for a moment here, we're going to have 10 lobes that are coming out right there, 10 lobes, all not quite exactly equal in amplitude, but, but fairly close. And as we approach uh, L equals three lambda, uh, we're now going to end up with six, uh, six lobes here. So and I'll, the animation stops at three lambda. Uh, just notice here that now we've got uh, we've six very narrow lobes. And for example, if we were to uh, find a way to physically block five of those lobes, then uh, right here, for example, uh, this top lobe is at, at 90 degrees. That's extremely narrow. And in some cases of an antenna, you want an extremely narrow or an extremely directed antenna. And so uh, this might be a place where we'd want to be able to use something like that. There are other reasons why we might not choose to use L equals 3 lambda other than the radiation pattern. Uh, and in general, uh, we're going to find that uh, L equals 0.5 lambda is a very desirable antenna. So now we've seen uh, an animation of what that looks like. Now we're going to go ahead and, and, uh, and figure out what is the, the math, uh, what is, the, what is a, a sample calculation that would look like. So we're going to find the magnitude of the electric field when a 100 megahertz wave is transmitted from a 1 meter dipole antenna to a receiver, sorry for all the typos here, to a receiver 20 meters away at an angle of 30 degrees from the axis of the antenna. Uh, and the amplitude of the current entering the, entering the antenna is 100 milliamps. This is one of those problems where it seems like we're given a lot of information, but every piece of that information is really important. Well, the first thing we can do is we can calculate the wavelength. The wavelength is C divided by F, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th, divided by the frequency in this case was 100 times 10 to the sixth, and that gives us a wavelength of three meters. Um, and then we can calculate k. k equals two pi divided by lambda, which is two pi divided by three meters, which is 2.094 meters to the minus one. And then I'm just going to go ahead and say 30 degrees converted into radians is 0.5236 radians. Uh, I don't think that we need to, to uh, duplicate the equation because the equation is, uh, is equation 30.10. So we're just going to use that equation. I'm going to go ahead and begin to uh, plug, plug things into that equation. Now what I'm looking for here is the magnitude of the electric field. So of course I'm going to omit the j, but I'm also going to omit the e to the minus jkr because the magnitude of that is always 1. So what I'm going to find then is that the magnitude of e and it's e in the theta direction, is equal to 60 times i sub m, which is 0 0.1, divided by 20, which is r, because it's 20 meters away, times the cosine of uh, k, which is 2.094, times l, which is 1, divided by 2, divided by 2, times the cosine of uh, theta, which is 0 0.5236. Now on my calculator, I have to put it into a special settings mode to use radians, um, but it is worth the effort. This is minus the cosine of 2.094 divided by 2, and that's all divided by the sine of oh, 2.094 times 1. It's not just k, it's k times l. And although that wouldn't make a difference mathematically, I don't want to omit it there. Uh, and this is divided by the sine of 0.5236. And then I just want to show you a couple of the intermediate steps here. E sub theta, the magnitude, is equal to 60 times 0.1 is 6, divided by 20 is 0 0.3. So this is 0 0.3 times. And if you do the math, and, and I would encourage you to go ahead and just try this one on your calculator to make sure that we're on the same exact page. Um, you end up with 0.6163 minus 0.5, all of that quantity divided by 0.5. And when I do all of that, I get 0.0698 volts per meter, which is 69.8 millivolts per meter. So I think that it's, it's rewarding to have both a conceptual understanding of what's going on, but also to be able to drill down and really see at this particular point for this particular antenna with this particular signal, I can calculate what is the strength of the electric field going to look like.
Now the strength of the magnetic field is of course, as we know from kind of the definition of the impedance of free space, it's just going to be the electric field divided by z sub zero. It'll also be 90 degrees, uh, it'll be uh, perpendicular to the electric field, so remember that the electric field was e sub theta and this is h sub phi. So we can uh, calculate the magnetic field that corresponds to, the, to that electric field and you can do it in one of two ways. You can either do the full calculation in equation 30.12 <clears throat> or, so I'm looking for the magnitude here, or you can see that it's equal to the magnitude of the electric field divided by z sub zero. And you can tell from the amount of space that I've left you here that I, I think that it's probably a good choice to do just 69.8 millivolts per meter divided by 377 uh, ohms and that works out to be 1.86 times 10 to the negative fourth amps per meter. You could rewrite that as 186 microamps per meter. And that's in and that's in the that's in the phi direction. Um, or you could of course use equation 30.12 and then double check that you had done it that done it correctly. But really the only difference between 30.12 and the and the equation that we had for the electric field, which was quite a distance up here, so that's equation 30.10. The only difference is that 30.10 uh, doesn't have a z sub zero in the denominator, whereas 30.12 does. So this z sub zero right here is the only difference between those two equations. So it kind of seems, I did do it just to double check that I had done the first calculation correctly, but I'm not sure that you need to do it. Uh, and then the last thing that we can do uh, is, as we learned from uh, equation 18.18, .18, we can calculate the average pointing vector of a sinusoidal field. And so if you uh, plugged in the 30.10 uh, for, the electric, for the, uh, the electric field and 30.12 uh, for the magnetic field, so there's 30.10 and there's, that's 30.12. Remember that the uh, asterisk here, complex conjugate, means that, for example, every place that there's a j in uh, h sub phi, that's going to become a negative j. And so there's really uh, only two occurrences of j in that equation, and both of them are gonna, are gonna have an extra negative sign. That means, for example, that the e to the minus jkr is gonna cancel with the e to the plus jkr, uh, and it also means that a j times a negative j is also gonna go to one. So we end up with an expression here where every single thing got squared except for z sub zero. And this is a very common thing to make a little mistake on is to square everything. But remember that z sub zero only appeared in the denominator of h. It didn't appear in the denominator of e. So we can then calculate the average pointing vector. Oh, before we do that, let's look at this animation. Here we have another animation where you can see what is the average pointing vector for this dipole antenna look like from above. And I'm gonna go ahead and show that animation right now. In this animation, we can see that the dipole antenna is causing radiation to propagate away perpendicular to the antenna. This is actually showing a, a very detailed analysis uh, performed by computer simulation to be able to see exactly what's happening to the waves as they're progressing away. You can see that uh, this is not just focusing on the, the far field, which is what we've really been speaking about, but it also shows the, the uh, effect really close to the antenna as well. But the most important things to see, first of all, is that, is that the uh, propagation is really occurring perpendicular to the antenna and that it is uh, it is following the same uh, frequency of oscillation as the voltage that's on the antenna. So now that you have that animation, you have a better picture, a better, literally a better picture of what's going on with this dipole antenna. I think that in, in this chapter more than most, it's important to balance a conceptual understanding or a visual representation of what's going on with the ability to actually do the, do the math. So we can, do, uh, we can do our calculation of P, I'm sorry, not P, it's S. So S is the average pointing vector. So S av is equal to one half times the magnitude of E times the magnitude of H, and both of those were vectors. Um, and then I know that this is gonna be pointing in the A sub R direction. So I don't need to be careful about E cross H star. I just can take one half times the magnitude of each of them. Uh, and then I know that that's gonna be in the A sub R direction. So this is equal to one half times 69.8 times 10 to the minus third times 1.86 times 10 to the minus fourth uh, and that's in the a sub r direction and that is equal to 6.46 6.46 uh, times 10 to the minus sixth a sub r watts per meter squared 
and that's equal to 6.46 microwatts per meter squared in the A sub R direction. So the finite dipole antenna has a lot of stuff going on. Uh, the ability to do these calculations is, is important, but I have to say that if you, if you took just an, an extra couple of minutes on this section, the one thing that I really want you to sort of pay attention to and to be able to really have a, a good understanding of is fig figure 30.4. I think that this figure, uh, which uh, I'll make that MATLAB code available to you if you want to customize it, I think that that's very important. I think that it gives you a lot of information to see what's going on, especially in the transition from an infinitesimal decimal dipole to a dipole and to a finite dipole and then also to see the extra lobes as they come in to see how you can have um, major lobes and minor lobes how lobes can can become nulls and so forth I think that that animation really adds a lot to the conceptual understanding of what's going on <clears throat> Now the second thing we're going to talk about today is the second fundamental type of an antenna. Uh, and you'll remember that last time I, I mentioned to you that a finite dipole is, is a little bit like, uh, a, little bit like a, a pendulum. You know, if, you're, if, you, if you've got a hypnotist who's trying to get you to fall asleep, they're going to swing a watch in front of your eye, and it's swinging back and forth from one side to the other side, from one side to the other side. That's just like a finite dipole antenna. But the other possibility would be that they would take that watch and they would spin it in a circle, or it would be a merry-go-round, or it would be a, a satellite orbiting around the Earth. That centripetal acceleration is, it is, is acceleration in exactly the same way. And so again, anytime that an electric charge undergoes an acceleration, <clears throat> then we're going to find that, that uh, that's going to create electromagnetic waves. So we can uh, accelerate them linearly, which is what we've been talking about now, or we can accelerate them centripetally, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So we've talked about a uh, loop of wire before, all the way back in chapter 12, in section 12.4, and at the time we introduced this concept of the magnetic dipole moment. And this magnetic dipole moment essentially said, you have a loop of current, uh, and it's going to create a magnetic field. So as that magnetic field is progressing, let me think about the direction... Um, yep, so it's going to be, uh, the current is going to be going this way on this side and this way on this side. And as it's going around, you put your thumb in the direction of the current. And at every point around the loop, they all point, uh, the, the magnetic field always points up for that, for, that, uh, for that loop. Now the pi times a squared is just going to be the cross-sectional area here. And then of course the current that's flowing around it, uh, that represents i. So being able to calculate the magnetic dipole moment is going to be important. As it turns out in the in later portions, in later in later discussions here, we're just going to use m without being a vector. That's just going to be the magnitude of m, which is just i times pi a squared. Maybe it isn't a circular loop. Maybe it's an oval loop, or maybe it's a. You could even have a quote unquote square loop. In those cases, it's not going to be pi a squared. It's just going to be the surface area of the loop. Um, and it, it's, it can be, a, it, maybe it isn't exactly going to be the same thing as we're talking about here, but it would be very similar. The shape of that loop doesn't have a great deal of impact on the magnetic, uh, magnetic dipole moment. <clears throat> so here's a picture of the geometry of, of a loop antenna. You can see that there is still a, a current that's going around the loop, and I've, I've drawn the loop in red here to try to distinguish it from all of the other lines that are going on. We, we do take a particular point on the circumference of the antenna, and we take an observation point out here. And the observation point is a distance r prime from the, from the point uh, that, we're, that we're on the loop, but it's a distance of r from the center of the loop. Uh, it's also a distance, or it's an angle of theta down from the perpendicular. So if you have the loop, there will be a perpendicular, and if the observation point is out here, then theta is down from the perpendicular. That's what's being shown in figure 30.6. Also, uh, the, the, the radius of that loop is A, and the angle of the particular point that we're looking at is, uh, is, is phi. Now again, uh, this is going to create both an electric field and a magnetic field. The electric field is going to be pointing out of the screen in this case, and if you take E, I'm sorry, it's pointing into the screen. E cross H is going to give you S. And so once again, we're going to find that the, the S is actually pointing away from the loop antenna. It's radially pointing away. So uh, we can classify and uh, loop antennas as either small loops or large loops. Uh, a small loop is kind of like um, uh, an infinitesimal dipole antenna. Uh, and in that case, the circumference of the loop must be much less than the wavelength. In this case, we could say it's just less than lambda over 10. And I'm kind of going to just skip all of the derivation here because 
I think that we've seen enough of these derivations and they all kind of blend together. I just want you to know that the magnetic field uh, can be found as equation 30.15 and the electric field can be found as equation 30.16. Notice again, the only difference between these two is that the H has a Z sub zero in the denominator and the E does not. We still have the E to the minus JK uh, and, and uh, I'm using R there. So this should have been E to the minus JK R. Sorry about that. Uh, so it's E to the minus JK R divided by R. I want you to notice that, that if you flash back to, to the discussion of the infinitesimal dipole, the infinitesimal dipole had a sine of theta and it had an, a one over R dependence. It, it even also had an E to the minus JKR. The only thing that was different between a, a, a small loop antenna and an infinitesimal dipole antenna is the, is the constants that precede it. Well, there's one other dis difference and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. But for right now, just think, think that the infinitesimal dipole and the small loop antenna are very, very similar to each other. And, and what we found for the infinitesimal dipole was the same thing we're gonna find here. The average pointing vector, we should have an A sub R on the end here. The average pointing vector is gonna be one half times the electric field times the magnetic field. And everything is gonna get squared except for Z sub zero. And then the, and then the uh, oh, and this is actually H star because this is a positive uh, J right here. So the e to the minus jkr and the e to the positive jkr are going to cancel. And what we end up with is uh, the average pointing vector has a 1 over r squared dependence and it has a sine squared theta dependence. And uh, everything else here at that capital A should be a lowercase a. Sorry for the typos today. Um, but but the, leading, uh, the leading constant, so omega squared mu sub zero squared, this m, remember that's the dipole, the magnetic dipole moment. I didn't slip a mass in here. That's the magnetic dipole moment, which is equal to pi a squared times the current. Uh, and that, that would be the magnitude of the current. So, uh, and then there's a k squared, and then there's in the denominator a 32 pi squared and a z sub zero, not squared. Uh, but, the, but the most interesting part of it is the one over r squared and the sine squared of theta. So the first thing that's, that's interesting, two things worth noting about this equation. The first one we've already mentioned, it is very, very similar to an infinitesimal dipole antenna. The second thing is if you remember in the infinitesimal dipole, if I draw an infinitesimal dipole over here, remember that the waves radiated out perpendicular to the, to the direction of the dipole. But if we look at a loop, so now I'm gonna look at the loop straight on. This is interesting. The waves radiate out in the same plane as the, as the loop. So it's not perpendicular to the loop as you might have expected. It's actually coplanar with the loop. So that's interesting. For a small loop that is, that is the opposite direction as what, we would, as what we would have seen for a finite dipole, or for an infinitesimal dipole. Okay, last example for today. Um, a loop antenna with a radius of six centimeters has a sinusoidal current of amplitude 200 milliamps and a frequency of 10 megahertz. What is the average pointing, my goodness. I need to get an editor. What is the average pointing vector at a distance of 10 meters and at an angle of 45 degrees away from the normal vector of the loop? So I know that m is equal to i times pi a squared, which is equal to 0 0.2 times 0 0.06 squared times pi, which is 2.26 times 10 to the minus third, and uh, that's going to be units of um, amps meter squared. I know that omega is equal to two pi times f, which is two pi times 10 times 10 to the sixth, which is 6.28 times 10 to the seventh radians per second. I know that k is equal to omega divided by c, which is 6.28 times 10 to the seventh divided by three times 10 to the eighth. And that works out to be 0 0.2094 uh, meters to the minus one or radians per meter, meters to the minus one. And then I can calculate the average, the average pointing vector is going to be, and I'll just do the, um, let's see, what is the average pointing vector? So that, that's a vector. Um, that's equal to, and I'm using equation 30.18 at the top of the page here. This is gonna be 
oops, 6.28 times 10 to the seventh uh, squared times 1.2566 times 10 to the minus sixth squared times 2.26 times 10 to the minus third squared times 0 0.2094 squared. All of this is divided by 32 pi squared, that's a pi, times 377, which is z sub zero, times one over r squared, times the sine squared of theta, which is 45 degrees. And if you do all of that, if you plug all of that into your calculator, and if I've done it correctly, this will be equal to 8.28 times 10 to the 11th, or 10 to the negative 11th uh, watts per meter squared times a sub r, which is equal to 82.8 picowatts per meter squared times a sub r. <coughs> so we now have the ability to calculate even for a loop antenna, we have the ability to calculate the electric field, which I didn't ask you for, or the magnetic field, which I didn't ask you for, or in this case, the pointing vector that I did ask you for. Okay, the last two subjects for today are really a little bit more conceptual. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, Professor Yagi and Professor Uda. They came up with uh, the antenna, which bear their, bears their name, or honestly, it's most frequently just known as a Yagi antenna. Um, when I first encountered Yagi antenna, I thought that Yagi was an abbreviation for something, but it's the name of the person who co-invented it. It consists of multiple parallel linear antenna elements, which is to say finite dipole antennas. Often each of these are one half wavelength. So as I mentioned to you at one point earlier today, uh, a half wavelength antenna is, uh, uh, is often uh, a, good, a good choice. Sometimes though, they can be a variable length. Um, Yagi antennas are widely used as both transmitting and receiving antennas. We'll talk about that in, in the next section. In addition to the primary dipole moments, which is sort of what you would expect from a Yagi antenna, they also include reflectors and directors. And the reflectors and directors seem like they might not be important, but it turns out that they're actually extremely important. Uh, they, they modify the antenna's radiation pattern, uh, they create constructive interference, and they increase the directivity and gain of these antennas. So here's what a Yagi antenna looks like. You can see in this case there are, um, <clears throat> and I don't know which of these is which, but I think that these are probably the regular dipoles. Uh, and I, Whoops, not dipole. Uh, dipoles. And then uh, I think that this one is the reflector. And then I think this one is probably the director. And honestly, I don't know which one that is. So uh, what happens is that there are a very detailed analysis of, of Yagi antennas that tell you exactly where to put the dipoles, the reflectors, and the directors so as to create constructive interference. And those, that constructive interference is, is shown here in figure 30.8. Uh, and if you click on figure 30.8, you can see an animation that shows exactly how focused the wave is going out the front as these dipoles, reflectors, and redirectors uh, interfere constructively with one another to create that narrow wave. So here you can see how the Yagi antenna, uh, at least conceptually, is going to have constructive interference between the, the primary dipole, the reflector, and then other sort of redirectors. Um, and, and the thing that I want you to take away from this is that the wave coming out the top here, the wave that's, that's pointing out the top of the, of the antenna is extremely coherent. It's extremely, it has a very tight uh, band. It's very, it's very directed. It's very focused in one direction. Of course, in all other directions, it's really not because we only have the in-phase constructive interference coming out one direction of the Yagi antenna. Uh, and so what this means is that it is an exceptionally good uh, uh, transmitter in one direction, uh, and then in all the other directions it won't be as good. But very often what we want is a focused beam coming in one direction. So now you can have a, a, at least a better conceptual understanding of what's going on with the Yagi antenna. Uh, we're not going to do the math. It's sort of really beyond the scope of our discussion here, but it's, uh, it's good to know that the Yagi antenna does in fact provide you a very focused wave and that that focused wave can give you a, a good solid uh, transmission capability.
The last thing today, and, and I'm not going to read this to you, I would encourage you to read this whole section because it's really well written. Uh, probably some typos though. Um, complementarity of antennas. I, just, I want you to, to sort of as you're as you're sort of finishing up your electrical and computer engineering studies, I hope that you've encountered this concept of complementarity before. For example, you have an electric motor. It, it receives electrical energy and it, and it creates rotational energy. But if you take that exact same structure and you force the rotation, it generates electricity. It generates voltage. And so you can either use the same physical object to convert electrical energy into rotational energy or rotational energy into electrical energy. The first one we call a motor, the second one we call a generator, but they're really the exact same thing. Now you might do some, some tweaking here and there to optimize it as a motor or to optimize it as a generator, but the physics is the same. In the same way, capacitors and inductors are complementary of each, of each other, complementary of each other. Uh, a, a capacitor converts a, a time derivative of voltage into a current, and an inductor converts a time derivative of current into a voltage. So they fill complementary roles. But maybe the best example of complementarity is, is in an antennas. What we've been talking about so far is converting things into transmitters. We've talked an awful lot about transmitting. We haven't really talked about receiving. But it turns out that if you design an antenna to be an excellent transmitter, it also makes it into an excellent receiver as well. We've talked a lot about directivity. We've talked about gain. Uh, these are things that we're going to define formally next time, but you can get the idea. Directivity means that I'm very focused. I can only really see a certain narrow uh, geometric region, uh, and that would either be I'm going to transmit a narrow beam or I can only receive a narrow beam. Uh, and if you talk about gain, that would be like how efficient is the antenna at converting the electrical signals that I give it into electromagnetic radiation. Maybe it is super efficient at converting it into electromagnetic radiation. Complementarity says that that same antenna would be super efficient at receiving signals and converting them into electricity. So if you think just as a one concrete example of this, what we just talked about was how a loop antenna can create electromagnetic waves. But remember that we've also talked about how if you have a loop of, of a conductor and you have a time changing amount of flux that passes through it, magnetic flux that passes through it, you'll create a voltage. And, and so uh, Faraday's law essentially says that, that that same loop antenna that we just proved can be a transmitter will also be able to be a receiver as well. Ultimately, and I don't have a, a, a detailed proof of this, I think that what happens is the complementarity really comes from the symmetry of Maxwell's equations. If you go back and look at Maxwell's equations, they are extraordinarily symmetric. And things that don't seem like they would, they would be symmetric with each other, like electric fields and magnetic fields, it turns out that mathematically they are almost identical to each other. And so it's really interesting to see how that, the complementarity comes from Maxwell's equations. So as we conclude our discussion of antennas and really of electromagnetic fields over the next two chapters, that complementarity is going to become much more evident. We're going to talk about things serving as both transmitters and receivers. In fact, we're going to find that several other uh, characteristics of the antennas, which I've just talked about, such as gain and directivity, they're also going to be complementary. So if, if something has a good gain and a good directivity as a transmitter, it will also have good gain and good directivity as a receiver. So I'm going to try to stop talking about these just as transmitters. I'm going to begin to think about them as receivers as well, because of course, transmitters and receivers are complementary. They're also both very important to, a, to an electrical and computer engineer. If I have an excellent Wi-Fi antenna to transmit, but I don't have anything on the other end to receive, then what's the point? You really have to have antennas that come in pairs. If you don't have both a transmitter and a receiver, then why did you bother to do the other one? So let's wrap up today. When an antenna with a known radiation pattern is duplicated in a regular array, and in our case, what we did was we took a whole bunch of infinitesimal dipole antennas and we glued them together to make them into a finite dipole antenna. And what, what happens is there is the term that comes or the factor that comes from the element and there's the factor that comes from the array. And for, for an infinitesimal dipole, so for an infinitesimal dipole, the, uh, the uh, element factor is sine of theta. And for a linear array, like this one shown here, the array factor is this complicated function that's shown here. And that was all done sort of off screen. We didn't actually derive those equations because it would have taken another 10 pages and another hour to, to do that derivation. Uh, when we then plug those into to our calculations, we can find equations uh, for the electric field and for the magnetic field. Taking the product of those, we can calculate the average pointing vector uh, 
The finite dipole is a much better transmitter and a much better receiver by complementarity than the infinitesimal dipole was. I still probably haven't convinced you of that except with the animation of, of the radiation pattern, uh, but next time we're going to see why a finite dipole is so, so much better than an infinitesimal dipole. The finite dipole also has a relatively complicated radiation pattern that depends on the length of the antenna relative to the wavelength of the signal. And so as we saw in that animation, that as we go from a very small antenna to a very large antenna, the, the, the shape of the lobes and the number of the lobes really changes and, and really has an impact on the, on the behavior of that antenna. A small loop antenna, also we can calculate the electric field, the magnetic field, and the pointing vector for that. The small loop antenna has a radiation pattern identical to that of the infinitesimal dipole, different constants, but, but it has the same 1 over r squared for the, for, the, for the pointing vector, it has the same sine squared for the pointing vector, it has the same 1 over r and sine for both the electric field and the magnetic field. All of those things are identical to what we saw for an infinitesimal dipole. But uh, remember that the, the small loop has maximum emission radiated, uh, maximum radiated maximum radiation emitted within the plane of the loop. So if, if the loop were just laying flat on this paper, the uh, antenna is going to radiate uh, laterally, whereas for, a, for an infinitesimal dipole, it would, radiate, um, it would radiate perpendicularly. So it would be like this. Uh, the Yagi antenna uses multiple dipoles, reflectors, and directors. The picture that I showed had maybe only two to three, but those dipoles, that you can have eight to nine dipoles to have a really, really high quality Yagi antenna. Uh, and the combination of the dipoles, the reflectors, and the directors create constructive interference, and that constructive interference significantly improves the performance of those antennas. So a Yagi is much better than a, than a finite dipole. A finite dipole is much better than an infinitesimal dipole. And then antennas themselves are highly complementary, meaning that if you design an antenna to operate very well as a transmitter, it will also work very well as a receiver and vice versa.